Linnea Quigley basically got top billing and a paycheck to do a shower scene in today's movie. What a life. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're covering Steve Latshaw's video store staple, Jacko. Released in 1995 and featuring performances from people who were dead long before it was released, Jacko is one of those films kids who grew up in the 90s video stores will remember fondly. Jacko is the kind of low-budget film that arrived in the new release section with absolutely no fanfare, but that I would immediately rent and regret. This one had it all. Quigley, Brinks Stevens, a Halloween setting, and a killer scarecrow. But was that enough to fill five trick-or-treat bags with body parts? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons James Montgomery, my pal Meatwad, and Alessio Roik. Sorry if I butchered your last name, Alessio. If you'd like to sponsor some videos and free me from the ever-tightening shackles of YouTube's tyranny, which are literally choking the shit out of this channel at this point, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment and description below. And now, let's get bloody. We're not wasting any time in this one because we fade right in on this title card. Jacko, with no hyphen, despite the cover having a hyphen. If this is the kind of attention to detail we can expect from this movie, we may be in for a treat. At any rate, I'm really looking forward to this documentary that could be about Michael Jackson, Jackie Onassis, or that Guilty Gear fighting game character. Oh fuck, Jacko Lantern? Well, this changes things. Guess we're not gonna bother with the credits, because after that title reveal, we hop immediately to this meeting of the Midnight Society. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this story Jacko, or Jack-O-Lantern. I haven't really nailed down a title yet. Turns out he is actually telling a story, and to the surprise of absolutely no one, it sucks. The pumpkin man will steal your soul. But hey, at least Dr. Frankenfurter has stopped by. Also, I think Claudio Fragasso may have snuck on the set here, judging by the amount of fog machine in this shot. Back at the campfire, exposition is still happening. He told them a monster would come for them. Jacko. I'm not sure if that counts as a title mention or not, since I'm not sure what this movie's actual title is. I will say, it's a really bold move to open your film with like five minutes of exposition, though. I mean, look, I can paraphrase this for you in like one sentence. Townspeople killed Wizard, who in return cursed them and raised a demonic pumpkin monster to seek revenge. And from exposition to flashback. We're hitting all the lazy storytelling bases right out of the gate. I bet they just snuck into Pioneer days when they were closed to shoot this so they could avoid the filming fees. Um, how did they get a John Carradine headshot in the past? Then it's time for another great moment in horror film acting. I don't need you to remind me. I watched two sisters die at his hand. Jesus Christ, she's more wooden than the logs he's nailing together. After more jibber-jabber, Dad heads off to buy a pack of smokes, never to be seen again. And let's just hold this shot for as long as possible. We gotta kill 90 minutes somehow. No, really, this shit goes on for like 7 seconds. They'll copyright claim me if I show it all. Anyway, it turns out it was all just football practice. Things are even worse in the waking world. Oh, great, someone left the laundry out in the rain again. And here comes Jacko. Except this is a fake out. To a day football practice. I haven't seen dream sequence abuse this egregious since the Elm Street movies. Oh, and I guess we might as well start the credits now. So far this entire movie is credits and exposition. Starring Linnea Quigley. She has top billing and she only worked for three days on this film. I don't want to alarm anyone, but it looks like these credits are about to short circuit. Ryan Latshaw. Wait a minute. That's the director's kid. Nothing like nepotism. And now we've reached the special appearances part of the credits. You're gonna love this. Trust me. We kick things off with John Carradine. Carradine died in 1988. Jacko came out in 1995. Either he's a zombie acting from beyond the grave, or they used old footage. And Cameron Mitchell. He too was dead before this film released. Jacko has the distinction of being the last film of his career. I'm not sure if this is a credit sequence or an in memoriam at this point. Next up, Scream Queen brings Stevens. She's still alive at least, I think. And Don Wildsmith, aka the ex Mrs. Fred Olin Ray. We last saw her in Alienator. Definitely a lot of nepotism on this production. Screenplay by Patrick Moran. I feel like they misspelled his last name. That A should be an O. Produced by Fred Olin Ray. So you know this movie is gonna be quality. Directed by Steve Latshaw. 
If you've ever heard the commentary track for this movie with Latshaw and Fred Olin Ray, you can pretty much tell their working relationship was not a good one. With the credits over, we get right down to the important business of ripping off John Carpenter's Halloween. It's a pumpkin man, he's gonna get you! Then Timmy here spits a few verses. Mr. Jack will snap your spine, cut you in half with the scaly vine. <laughs> I can see why he didn't make it into the final Gravedigger's roster. Kid has no flow. Anyway, we almost get some pimp hands when MC No Flow starts wrestling with the director's kid, but then the witch lady shows up and intervenes. She escorts him home, and is she hitting on Dad? I'd love to see your spook house. I mean, that sounds dirty. Sean heads inside, and wait a minute, how is it suddenly foggy night? We were just outside in broad daylight. Is this house a time warp? I mean, Frankenfurter is here. Judging by all this smoke, he might have warped into the backstage area at a Willie Nelson show. And back to daytime. I have no idea what's going on at this point. Oh shit, here comes the wife. Act like you weren't just hitting on me. Oh yeah, this lady has crazy Karen eyes for sure. She's a pro at asking to speak to the manager. And in our other movie, Weird Kid has found Aleister Crowley. Oh wait, that's just John Carradine. Looking pretty good for a guy who's been dead seven years. From there, Poindexter heads to the barn where he finds the dad from the past? Yeah, sure. Let's just roll with that. Oh, and dead people. This may have happened in a barn, but someone here is clearly unstable. Oh shit, and Jack goes here. Dude looks like the toy getting a Halloween Happy Meal. Is this supposed to be scary? And football practice. Just blatant dream scene abuse at this point. Frankenfurter is here and is all like, let's do the time warp again. Wow, so did this lady just move in or what? We're gonna let some random lady who wandered in off the street just have free reign in your house. And with this scintillating dialogue, we managed to avoid what was sure to be the most awkward dinner ever. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to pass on dinner tonight. I, I have a prior commitment I completely forgot about. She probably has to go wander through some other family's house randomly. And since this movie wasn't random enough, let's add some more characters. Here's I Can't Believe It's Not Skeet Ulrich and Big Lot Shannon Doherty. They're out here looking for something. I hope it's the plot, or maybe even a better movie. Turns out all they find is this graveyard, filled with styrofoam tombstones. Back at the house, Poindexter and Dad are watching the boob tube. Sure hope they're checking out some sick flicks videos. Oh wait, they're watching Dr. Cadaver. Hi Cameron Mitchell. Back in the woods, I want to point out that 90s fashion was weird. You'd wear a half top with a half jacket with the sleeves rolled up. I mean, what's the point? Anyway, this is sick flicks, not Vogue. So getting back to the spooky stuff, these guys are feeling a little cross. Hmm, this looks suspiciously like the one the guy was carrying over at Pioneer Days. And Skeet finds a sickle. It's clearly one size fits all. Hey, remember how Linnea Quigley got top billing in this movie? Well, here she is, almost 25 minutes in, in her natural habitat, the shower. I can't show you basically any of this, but trust me, this is maybe the most gratuitous shower scene of Linnea's career, which makes it a very strong contender for most gratuitous shower scene of all time. I can just imagine Steve Latshaw sealing a deal with her agent. Yeah, we're gonna need her for three days. It's a really complex shower scene. A lot of angles and all that. And here are more characters you absolutely will not care about. Looks like these guys have been doing a lot of coke. I mean, look at all those bottles. This was just to break up the shower scene because now we're back. A water heater must be broken because it's looking a bit nipply in there. I can just imagine Steve Latshaw on the set. Okay, now rub this soap slowly on your butt. Now your chest again. Perfect, print it. I think I know why they called this movie Jacko. It wasn't because of the pumpkins. Anyway, all this sensual showering is interrupted by a phone call from Crazy Karen. And I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be a little in-joke reference to Night of the Demons. Babysit for Sean tomorrow night? Um, I've got this Halloween party to go to. See? Jacko is serious cinema. And apparently these guys are just gonna sit on that bike and not actually go anywhere. Which basically describes most of the Harley owners I know. Look, don't send me your hate comments, Harley owners. I'm sure you ride. Back in the house, father and son are having a talk. Are you my real dad? Oh god, they're forming the whitest rap duo since third base. Mr. Jack will break your back, cut off your head with a whack whack whack. Pumpkin man will steal your soul, he'll snatch it up and swallow it whole. Not gonna lie, they're still better than Machine Gun Kelly. Ooh, shots fired. Somebody grab some clippers, this fucking beard is weird. Over in our other movie, Not Matthew Lillard has a real cross to bear. And I guess it's gonna storm. Or something. I mean, look at these effects. Here's a live look at me waiting for something to finally happen in this goddamn movie. And because Jacko thinks we're complete idiots, we get another flashback. 
back. I never would have guessed this was the same cross they used back then. Thanks, movie. But wait, Jack goes here and he gives this guy a taste of his pimp hand. But our hero grabs the sickle and gets to work. Scythe knowing you. Boy, I hope that's it for kills with that thing. I'm out of scythe puns. Hey, we still have some old John Carradine footage we haven't used. Let's just toss it in here. I love that the film stock between this and the cutaways doesn't even match. This is like that scene in Things where they try to convince you all three of the actors are in the same room. Anyway, since budget Doug Bender took the cross out of the ground, it looks like bad things are about to happen. And <laughs> not a moment too soon. Stock footage Carradine approves. Fresh out of the ground, Jacko's doling out pimp claws. Looks like budget Skeet won't be back for the sequel. And not Shannon Doherty takes a shot to the face. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean a shot of blood. She flees, but all these vines keep tripping her. It's probably a good thing Jacko brought his scythe. Oh yeah, the harvest is about to get underway, which makes sense since she's wearing a crop top. And now it's time for football practice. I think this is a football practice record. We're gonna be ready for the Super Bowl at this rate. Also, why does this kid have a picture of himself on his nightstand? Back out in the woods, Frankenfurter has found some fresh corpses for his next experiment. And we get another Carradine cameo. There weren't movies when he was alive where he got less screen time than this. The next day, Linnea shows up and delivers the most awkward line ever. You're like a little boy about all the scary stuff. I like little boys. Look, there's no universe where Linnea Quigley is hitting on this schlub. You've destroyed my willing suspension of disbelief, Steve Latshaw. Inside, Poindexter's playing with his Steam Deck. I thought they'd be smaller. And another Carradine cameo. Um, yeah, let's just hold on to forever. We could use some padding. And nice transition. Very subtle. Well, shit, might as well hold this shot forever too. It's like six seconds of nothing. I don't know. I'm starting to suspect Steve Latshaw might be inserting random long takes in a lazy ploy to get Jacko as close to the 90 minute mark as possible. Looks like he came up short. We're not even at the 40 minute mark. But thank God that's over. Wait, what do you mean we're not even halfway? God, kill me now. So, we're just watching them watching Dr. Cadaver. I'm really glad I got to watch a movie of people watching a movie. The Coven? Did Mark Borchardt finally get that thing released? The Coven has Brink Stevens bouncing around in slow motion, but let's watch Exposition Theater instead. All this jibber-jabber is to explain shit we already knew. John Carradine was a wizard. The townspeople killed him. He cursed the town. Blah, blah, blah. Karen's like, hey, could you stop flirting with women in front of me, honey? Vivian here clearly doesn't understand the concept of personal space. Linda, can I help you with something? Jesus, we really are going to spend half of this movie watching what appears to be a better movie. Meanwhile, opening night at the Garage of Doom looks like it's going great. <laughs> what a crowd. Jesus, does anything ever happen in this movie? The shower scene feels like it was six fucking years ago. Well, at least the spook house has one customer. And Claudio Fragasso's fog machine makes a cameo. Back inside, things are gonna get awkward as all Dad's side pieces show up at once. It's like an episode of Three's Company. Do kids even remember Three's Company? Christ, I'm old. While that's going on, Ebenezer Scrooge here is about to get a visit from the ghost of Halloween past, aka Jacko. Since he gets gutted, it seems safe to say he was probably giving out those crappy circus peanuts to the trick-or-treaters. That's punishable by death in my book. His wife, meanwhile, is so desperate to get out of Jacko, she jams a butter knife in the toaster. It's pretty shocking. Not gonna lie, I jam a butter knife into the toaster to get out of the rest of this movie too. Say what you will, but she's looking nice and toasty. Toasty! Back at the spook house, Linnea's gotta go. Come on, open up! All these sugar-free gummy bears are giving me IBS. After taking the Browns to the Super Bowl, she takes Poindexter trick-or-treating. That's a pretty sweet costume, Jason Voorhees. In movie Pie, the biker couple head out to the woods to make out. But it's a trick because she gets spooked. He does get a treat, though, when she gives him a little pimp hand. Jumping yet again, we're back at the spook house, where Dad's Dracula impression is so bad it hurts. Even Frankenfurter is embarrassed. I mean, look at her red face. And since nothing is happening with any of our 1800 boring plot lines, let's add a new one. This guy's gonna lay some cable. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's really gonna lay some cable. That's director Steve Latshaw. It looks like Jacko is about to cut the cord and lower his bill, but like everything else in this goddamn movie, it never pays off. Case in point, these kids walk into the lamest jump scare in Sick Flicks history. Ah! <laughs> and I guess we're done with the spook house. By my count, they made two dollars. This lady is not taking the hint, it's time to go home. Can I call you an Uber or something? And long shot for no reason. I'm starting to suspect that nothing is ever going to happen in this movie.
But Jacko is still skulking about. This scene filmed in Tarantino vision. Then he shows up to bum a smoke. Nice costume, butthead. I guess they couldn't call him Pumpkinhead without getting sued. And heads up, this dude just got decapitated. And Jacko's not done. This might be the one cool shot in this entire disaster of a movie. She flees and the cable guy drops in. Literally. This performance is so bad he gets the hook. Honestly, for making something as dreadful as this movie, Steve Latshaw deserved a worse fate. Back at home, Mom makes a startling discovery. You could say it's pretty shattering. Don't worry, Riff Sheets will seem quaint in a few years when he hits puberty. You know what we haven't had in a while? A Carradine cameo. Linnea and Darren Pang call it a night, but surprise, here's Jacko! Darren Pang, that's a deep cut even for this show. This leads to another chase scene, but at least we get another cool Jacko shot. I'll say this, the costume is just cool enough to overcome the ridiculousness of it. Back at home, Vivian is jibber-jabbering about demons and nonsense, and then Dad says what we're all thinking. Vivian, shut the hell up. Poindexter is trying to get in, but Dad's busy fiddling with his knob. Hell yeah. No, I mean the doorknob, it's stuck. With the kid and Jacko gone, our boring heroes drive off in search of the manager. Or a climax to this movie. I don't know what they're gonna do, but I'm guessing they'll cross that bridge when they get there. And don't look now, but Poindexter is in grave danger. This is a literal plot hole. But before he can finish burying the kid alive, Vivian arrives and promptly gets gutted. Nice work, lady. You could say he made his point. Jesus Christ, look at this. It's literally a doll. With Vivian dead, Dad and Karen are the last hope. So this kid is probably doomed. He rises from his grave like this is Alder Beast, and hey, how's he not covered in dirt? Then out of nowhere, Dad hits Jacko with the flying cross body block, which causes him to get impaled on the cross. That looks pretty painstaking. And then this happens. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. Looks like a film processing mishap. Oh, and somehow Linnea Quigley and her sister lived. Huzzah. Bet they need a shower after all that. And here comes the swerve ending. Latchaw's gonna hold here for 23 entire seconds, and even with all that padding, he still only managed to make Jacko 88 minutes long. In his defense, it feels like 15 years. And that's Jacko. So what have we learned today? Well, for starters, we toss the term cult classic around way too liberally. Jacko is not a cult classic by any stretch of the imagination. It's just another low-budget horror flick dumped on VHS back in the 90s. It's a solid idea, and the costume is both cool and ridiculous, but the film is a chore to sit through. But enough about that. Can Jacko carve up enough corpses to earn a five barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Jacko is pretty middle of the road. We're treated to multiple scythings, an electrocution, an impaling, and one decapitation. The effects are pretty cheap looking, but there's just enough low budget splatter here to give Jacko a three barf bag rating. It's decently sick, but man, it's a chore to watch. Looking for another Halloween horror flick? Then be sure to check out my review of Cemetery of Terror. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.